In a courtroom, how a judge sees you may be as important as what you say. We'll talk about talking to the judge right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975, providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems, as well as PC-based systems and by viewers like you. Actions and presence are as important in a courtroom as our words. My guest is the Honorable Michael John Alloy, Chief Judge of the Circuit Court of Marion County, West Virginia. Judge Alloy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation, Dan. I, I wanted to have you in here because although you're the Chief Judge of Marion County, you are a relatively new judge. How long have you been on the bench? I have been on the bench for six months now. I was appointed and started my term on August 1st, 2011. You were appointed? Yes. The judges are elected. Well, when uh, Judge Fox retired, uh, at that point in time when a judge retires, then it's up to the governor to make an appointment until the next election. So uh, Judge Fox retired. I was appointed uh, by the governor, and I'll continue to serve to the end of the year. Uh, I do have to be elected, though, and that election will take place in May, the primary, and then the general election will be in the fall. So there's continuity provided if a judge retires or would die in office someone is nominated and appointed by the governor. Yes, and in fact, in, in Marion County, uh, we even had greater continuity because when Judge Fox retired, he agreed to continue to serve as a senior status judge until the new judge uh, took the position. So in Marion County, we had, we literally didn't even have one day where we didn't have a judge. Judge Fox continued to serve until I was appointed, until I was ready to start the position. That had to have made things a lot easier than the typical interruption. Well, the transition uh, was, in my opinion, any, anyway, seamless from my, from my perspective. And I really do give a, a great deal of uh, thanks to both Judge James and Judge Fox. Uh, when I received the appointment, I met with both of them early on. They were extremely gracious, extremely helpful, and it was very clear to me uh, that both of them were really in invested in my success as a judge, uh, really, really for the people of Marion County so we could continue to serve them well. And anyone who knows Judge Fox will know that um, he's just a very good, decent man, and what would have been more important to him than anything else is, is that uh, whoever followed him would be successful and that they would be able to continue to serve uh, the people of Marion County well. Now you were a practicing lawyer at the time you were appointed to become a judge. Yes. How long had you been practicing? I'd practiced law for over 28 years. Uh, same law firm started practice in May of 1983 with my cousin and law partner Tim Manchin, and we continued to practice uh, until August 1, uh, 2011. A large part of your practice concerned mediation. You had, uh, you were pretty well known all over the state as a mediator. You uh, chaired, I believe, the State Bar's Mediation Committee for a while and yes. uh, lectured and taught on mediation. Is there any irony that a mediator who tried to bring people together would become a judge where you tell people what they're going to do, uh, pretty much? Well, I, I mean, I, I can understand where people would look at that and think that there is irony, but, but, but I, I see no irony. And uh, in, from my perspective, anyway, I think uh, there are important skills that a mediator has that are also very transferable to what a judge does. Uh, and first of all, I think every judge has to be a good listener uh, because that's what we're there for, and we're there to listen to both sides. 
And unless uh, we don't listen clearly and intently with a strong desire to try to understand what it is uh, that people are trying to say, uh, what it is that they feel, then I don't think we can do our job effectively. And in addition to being a good listener, I think we're also a facilitator, a facilita facilitator of a process that helps people get disputes resolved. And so both of those skills were really essential to being a good mediator. Uh, now, the only difference is, is that if you listen and you facilitate uh, and the parties can't agree, then the judge will make the decision. In, in a mediation, if the parties can't agree, then they take the next step, which is court. Uh, so I have found that my mediation skills have really served me very well. Well, I, that really answers a lot of, of what my next question was going to be, but I'm going to ask it anyway because it, it's such an important question. What's the job of being a judge? What does a judge do? Well, you know, a, a judge really does, does many things, uh, but <clears throat> the important works of the court is that there are a lot of disputes in society. Uh, and they may, may be um, criminal matters in which people have committed criminal wrongs against individuals. They may be civil matters where someone has breached a contract, someone's been injured, someone they believe had been wrongfully fired. Uh, and so we need to have a system that responds to those disputes and those conflicts in an effective manner. Uh, and so in many ways, I believe uh, that the court system is what really holds together the fabric of society. Because if we don't have a meaningful way for people to re resolve their disputes, then they'll find some other way to resolve them. And so it's extremely important that they have confidence in the court, that they know that when they go to court that they will be listened to, they will be treated with respect, and they will at least get a fair decision. Now, a fair decision doesn't mean that it's going to be the decision that they want, uh, but it means that there will be a fair process because a judge can only make one decision and, and rarely will make both sides happy. But I do believe that if people feel uh, that they've had a fair process, that they've been listened to and they've had their opportunity to present their case, then I hope that they will feel that they've had their day in court and that they've had uh, the justice, hopefully, that they're entitled to in our society. So many times I have people come to my office, you probably did when you were practicing law also, and you would ask somebody, well, what do you want? They'd, they'd complain, say, well, what do you want? And often the answer would be, I want justice. Mm -hmm. And then I would have to explain, justice is the process you were just describing. It's not the outcome. The outcome, we just label that justice because that's the end result of this justice process. And you may or may not like the justice mm -hmm. you get, but you, you will get it by definition. Well, well, no, you're absolutely right. And, and I was just reading an article the other day. But uh, the essence of the article was, in terms of justice, really justice is about procedural ju justice. It's about process. It's about when you become before court, when anyone comes before court, that they know they will be treated fairly, uh, regardless of their economic status, regardless of their social status. They know that they will be here, they will be heard by the judge in a fair way, and that they will be treated fairly, everyone by the same rules. Now, uh, what happens, though, is in the end, there, there will be a decision that has to be made, and decisions by their very nature are, are going to be uh, in favor of one side or the other because uh, the dispute is such that you can't resolve it for both of them. But, you know, my focus is always on is that what do I do that will make sure that both sides have had a fair opportunity to be heard and that I know everything that I need to know that will help me make the most informed decision that I can. And you don't always make the final decision in every matter that comes before you. We've got six or 12 people mm -hmm. sitting over there to one side in the jury box that does a lot of that. Well, you know, absolutely. And, and in fact, in all trials, uh, really the judge's primary role is to make sure that there is a fair trial, that both sides are able to put on their cases in a way uh, that can most effectively represent their clients. And then ultimately the judge's responsibility is to make sure that that happens. It's the jury's responsibility then once that happens to make the ultimate decision as to whether or not someone's guilty or not, or whether or not they find in favor of one party or the other. But again, the judge's role is to make sure 
that at the end of that day in the courtroom that everyone has been treated fairly and they've been able to put on their case in a way that's meaningful, uh, that represents uh, the client in a way that the jury can make the decision uh, in an informed way. You're kind of the referee, the umpire, the gatekeeper yes. to what the jury gets to consider if there's a jury in the case. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think that's a fair analogy, but you know, at times, Dan, I, I think that a referee is, it, is sometimes too simpli simplistic of an analogy. You know, I'd like to think that what I'm doing is more significant than just calling balls and strikes from the bench. Uh, I, I think there, there's something far more going on in the courtroom uh, than that. And it's a, it's a, a matter of, um, of preserving an atmosphere where everyone knows that they're respected, everyone knows that they will be heard, and when they leave, they will feel that they have been treated fairly. Now, that's a broader perspective than just calling balls and strikes, at least in my opinion. And then they're not allowed to yell at you that you need to get new glasses or something like that. It's a very solemn uh, activity that goes on in the courtroom, and the judge is very much the authority figure there. You know, it, it, it is a solemn, um, it's a solemn responsibility and I often tell people that uh, that what goes on in a courtroom in many ways is I watch life suffering go on in front of me in many different forms. Uh, and so that is a very solemn thing. Uh, and, and in many ways it's a, it's a reminder to me of the blessings that I enjoy in life. But it also is an indicator to me uh, that society has given the judicial branch the obligation to respond to those in a meaningful way. Uh, and again, if we don't respond to it in a meaningful way, then they'll have to find other choices to do so. And it is solemn, it's serious work, but of course it's serious work. We impact people's lives in very intimate ways. Uh, and that's the most serious work I can think of. We're talking about how a judge sees those appearing in his or her court. My guest is the Honorable Michael John Alloy, Chief Judge of the Circuit Court of Marion County, West Virginia. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. I, I have always wondered, since I've never served in a judicial mm -hmm. position, you walk into the courtroom, you're, you're on the bench, and you've got some feelings, oh, and we're not gonna sure. talk about your sure. personal feelings necessarily, no. but you look out, and there are the people whose lives you are going sure. to affect. What do you think, what do you, what do you see when you look out at those people? What do you consider? You know, any time I walk out into the bench, uh, and I do look at the people in the courtroom, uh, and it's a reminder to me of uh, the honor that's been bestowed upon me to serve in this position. And it is an honor that's a sacred honor. It's one that is a reminder to me that, you know, the most important things that go on in people's lives are at stake. And so in that moment concerning the people in front of me, uh, I have an obligation to listen and to listen deeply to understand the fullness of the conflict that's going on in front of me, to treat everyone who is in front of me with respect so they, they also understand the dignity that takes place in a courtroom that's essential for it to be honored and respected. Uh, and, and so you're right that there's really this solemn occasion when you sit down and you think, my goodness, um, I'm going to make a decision that will impact these uh, people in front of me in a very serious way. And uh, what I do um, in that quiet moment is, is um, again, gain the perspective that I need to hope, hopefully come out in, in the right way, the right thinking. For example, in my mind, uh, there's never a thought that I'm going to make this decision because I can. I'm gonna show them that I'm judge. I'm gonna show them who has the power. Those thoughts on us that just don't enter my mind. What my thought is, is what decision do I need to make? What decision will have the opportunity or, or the ability to affect the conflict in front of me in a way that's most meaningful and most helpful? 
Now, sometimes that may be that the person in front of me simply needs to be separated from the rest of us uh, to protect my neighbors and my, and my friends and the people in our, our community. Uh, sometimes it may mean that there are things that we can do to help them uh, along the way. But it's, it's always guided by um, simply what do we do to do my part on that day to really um, promote the cause of humanity and maybe we're one step further after that hearing than we were before. I come into your courtroom as a litigant, as one of the parties. I have my lawyer with me. You look out and you see me, you're going to form an opinion about me just by looking at me. We, it's inescapable. We all do that. What do you want me as the litigant to be in your courtroom? What do you want me to do in your courtroom to help you make a decision? Well, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right, Dan, that the communication is far more than just what you say. And, and there are many studies that say that um, when you communicate, uh, most of it may be with your body, uh, your, your mannerisms, the look in your eyes, the infliction in your voice. Uh, and, and so I certainly do my best when I'm in the courtroom to act in a way uh, in a very sincere way to show respect to the parties. And so when they're speaking, I look at them uh, and, and I want to make it very clear that I'm listening to them. And I speak in a way that I hope that my voice will convey the importance of the moment that's before me. And so I would hope that whoever comes into the courtroom recognizes the significance of the moment. And so I think that when something is important, you reflect that by how you dress. Uh, now, l let me say this. It has nothing to do with how nice your clothes are, how much money you can spend on them. It was very clear to me in one hearing when someone came in uh, that they did their very best to pull out the best shirt they had, the best tie they had. They were neat. They had it tucked in. I, I could tell that they had groomed themselves in, in a way that they knew that this event was important. And uh, that just said something to me. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that when I make a decision, the decision is always going to be based upon the substance of the case. But the truth is, is that when people communicate, I think uh, your message becomes a little more clear when you do it in a voice uh, that's respectful, uh, when you do it in words that are respectful, when you address the issues that are before the court. Anything that goes from, f from that context can be distracting. And if you distract someone, then it makes it more difficult to focus on the issues it should be focused on. Does the quality of a person's speech, the words they use, make any significant difference to you? You know, for me, what's, what makes a difference is the, um, the sincerity of what they have to say. You know, wh whether or not there's, there's, there's proper g grammar or, or whether it's, it's, uh, the words are beautiful or it flows in such a way, uh, I have had people say to me th things that I can tell is coming from the heart that, uh, that um, they are searching for ways to try to convey to me uh, how they've been impacted by what's happened. And it's almost that you could feel it in, in the courtroom. Uh, and then I've also had people who probably said, if you read the words on paper, uh, they would have appeared so eloquent. But when they came out of someone's mouth, it became very clear that there wasn't a connection between what they were saying and what they felt. So for me, again, I look at the fullness of what's taking place in a courtroom, uh, what's sincere, what's meaningful, who is really trying to convey a message uh, that represents who they are and what it is that needs to take place in that courtroom. And I can tell you uh, that uh, jurors understand that. I don't know how many times you've had a conversation uh, when you leave a room and someone will say, boy, I, wasn't what they had to say, wasn't that beautiful? And, uh, and then you'll ask, well, what did they say? Well, I can't remember, but it was just beautiful <laughs> because it's what they felt. And, and you can tell that when someone's sincere. And you can also tell when someone's not sincere. Uh, and, and so you hope that what takes place in a courtroom um, is, is honesty, sincere honesty, uh, not honesty that's made up. Uh, jurors can spot a fraud and, and judges can spot a fraud. And what we're looking for is the genuine truth. 
We're talking about how a judge sees those appearing in his or her court. My guest is the Honorable Michael John Alloy, judge of the, Chief Judge of the Circuit Court of Marion County, West Virginia. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Well, what do you not want to hear? Well, you, you walk in, you sit down, and, and somebody starts off on something. What do you not want to hear them starting off on? Well, it's a good question. Well, um, what I don't want to hear uh, are, are two people talking over each other. Um, uh, and, and, and let me say this, what's impressive to me as a court is a lawyer who's really listening. And what I mean by that is, is certainly one lawyer will get up and they'll make a presentation. And I listen to that. And then um, the other lawyer will get up to, to make a presentation. Now I understand they have their points to make, but I'm wondering have they, have they heard anything that the other side had to say? Now. If that lawyer listened to the other side and what they were saying, and they were able to respond to that, and then blend that with the arguments that they needed to make, then that to me is just very helpful. Because as a judge, I'm always trying to put this in context, both sides, and I always appreciate help in putting it in context. And uh, what becomes very frustrating is when you have someone who stands up to speak who has either not listened or not heard a single thing the other, the other person has had to say. Because again, from a judge's perspective, you're trying to understand everything and how it fits in context. And for example, uh, if, if a lawyer would stand up and say, Judge, you know, I, I listened to the argument that he or she had to make, and, and this really appears to me to be their strong point. And so let me tell you how I view that point. That's educational to me. That's helpful. I'm, as a judge, trying to gather information that's going to help me make the best decision I possibly can. Uh, and so I have to tell you, when that happens in a courtroom, and when you have two lawyers who are listening to the other, who are responding to each other, it becomes a good dialogue. They most effectively represent their clients, and they help the job. They help the judge uh, do his or her job the best, the best they can. I, I have on occasion sensed uh, when in the courtroom that the judge is sitting there saying, "Help me out. Uh, tell me something I don't know about this. You, you clearly want something. Tell me why you should get that." And I have seen judges. Uh, change their mind, at least appear to change their mind, based on the information that they get during the proceeding from the parties, from the lawyers. Uh, ideally, you come into the courtroom as a judge, a blank piece of paper. Mm -hmm. You know what the law is, you know what the facts of the case are because you read the documents, but now tell me why you should get what you want. Tell me how I can use the law to help you out. If once I become convinced that you're deserving of that help. You ever pulled a Judge Judy on the people in your courtroom? And by that I mean lecture them, be harsh with them, tell them that they're, well, idiots or undeserving of being there or whatever it is she does. And, there, and I should mention, when we're talking about television judges, I, I mentioned Judge Judy because I think that's the oldest program that's been on the air the longest. Do you ever do that stuff? No, I, I think that that at times uh, the television judges and the contact, the conduct, and how they conduct themselves is just so disrespectful of the parties, and I find it offensive. Uh, you know, I have people in front of me who are suffering or going through difficult times in their lives, and and the last thing I should do is treat them with disrespect and and yell. Uh, you know. I don't need to do that in a courtroom. Now, there are times, certainly, when decorum has to be preserved in a courtroom. But I think a judge does that by setting their, their, their own example on their tone of voice, uh, how you listen to people. Uh, and you can easily, if someone's speaking over someone else, you can stop the process and say, excuse me, um, you know, I can't, I can't hear uh, what you're saying while the other person's speaking. Now, if you wait, uh, you'll have your opportunity to do so. And I've never had to say anything other than that. Uh, um, and then the parties will start listening to each other. Uh, but, you know, to, to yell at people, to call people names, to embarrass them, to humiliate them, is I, I think really represents what's ugly about society, which represents uh, what people think is now how we should communicate, which is not to listen, but simply to yell at each other and see who can bunk, become creative, uh, most creative, with just these uh, these name calling. 
that doesn't do anything to promote the cause of society. And, and I sometimes will let them know very clearly what you've just done is not helpful. It's not persuasive. This is what I need to hear. And so I hope that I can set some example on how it is that we're to conduct ourselves in a courtroom. And not only that, some example on how we should uh, conduct ourselves with each other. Would you consider becoming a consultant for presidential debates? <laughs> Maybe get a handle on that there. No, no one has asked me. And, and you know what? I, I think people get tired of it. They, they want people who know how to communicate and listen to each other, treat each other with respect. Judge Michael John Alloy, thank you, sir, for being with us. Thank you, Dan. It was my pleasure. Thank you also for being with us. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. On the Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us email at thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by a major grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and legal system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. By the generous support of Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 providing high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems, as well as PC-based systems. And by viewers like you. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.